Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 19th Shaka Khanam Cancer Symposium. This is the medical physics session. In this session, we have three very interesting talks. Um, each talk is going to be about 40 minutes with the first 30 minutes uh, for the speaker and then the for the talk and the next, uh, the last 10 minutes, about 10 minutes for any question and answers. Um, first, I would like to invite Mr. Nick Hardcastle. He is a research medical physicist um, at the Peter McCallum Cancer Center in Melbourne, Australia. He's a certified radiation oncology medical physicist and a lead research lead for the Department of Physical Sciences and a lead physicist for the Peter Mac Sabre Service. So uh, welcome, Nick. Thanks for having me. Hi. I'll just share my screen. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for the invitation to, to speak to you guys. I really appreciate some of the positives to come out of COVID that we can talk internationally um, very easily without having to jump on a plane. <clears throat> um, so uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, please contact me at either of the, the addresses below if you have any questions after the talk, always happy to chat to anybody. So my talk content today, I'm just gonna give a, a brief overview of the Sabre program at Peter Mac, uh, cover some of the, the different aspects of the Sabre process from start to finish, and then do a bit, of, a bit more of a deep dive into motion management and treatment planning, because I think in terms of where the challenges are, motion management to me is, is probably one of the key things. I do have to disclose that our group does receive funding from various medical systems for some kidney saver work. And I just want to acknowledge uh, the whole Peter Max Saber service for all the, the talk content. There's a lot of people that do a lot of work in this service, um, uh, including uh, our, our service lead, Shanka Saber, and, and Professor Thomas Cron, who was the lead physicist at when, when the service started 10 years ago. Okay, so just briefly, characteristics of Saber. So stereotactic ablative body radiotherapy, I think the two key terms there are stereotactic, meaning really um, tight um, geometric um, requirements and ablative, meaning very high dose per fraction. So we really want to ablate the target. So it's a slightly different biology. So we have a high dose per fraction, typically in one to five fractions. We have small fields because we, we need to have small targets because um, that's really the only safe way to deliver it uh, without overdosing our critical structures. We often will have non-complainant geometry, depending on where uh, we're treating. Uh, quite often heterogeneous density, which introduces challenges when paired with small fields in terms of dose calculation. And a lot of the time our things are moving quite a lot. So this is a, a pretty challenging um, technique and, and we, we basically use all the tools at our disposal in radiation therapy to achieve good SABRE. So our Sabre service at Peter Mac, we have, we have five campuses uh, with, six, with 16 Linux and we deliver about, treat about 6,000 uh, 6, to 7,000 patients per year across the five campuses. And we're doing Sabre at all the five campuses. And we have uh, a variant treatment planning system, Eclipse and variant Linux at all campuses. And this is roughly what we treat. So it's half, uh, so, so each column here is a year. Um, this is number of targets. So, so for example, if the patient had two metastases treated, that would be counted as two. <clears throat> um, and, and, and you can see a, a steady increase from 2010 when we started the service to, to now in, in a number of our different sites, but roughly half of our service is lung and a bit of a smattering of everything else. Um, and we, we, we definitely prescribe to the oligometastatic paradigm and, and go chasing after metastases in fit patients if they're limited um, in, in number in terms of metastases. Um, some of the key things we have started doing a lot more of recently are liver. Now, let me just get my pointer up. Uh, uh, liver, we've, we've, we've really ramped that up. We've started doing pancreas a bit more this year, and we've also started treating some, um, some cardiac, um, some ventricular tachycardia this year as well. Um, in terms of fractionation, um, we do uh, do a lot of single fraction SABRE and, and that, that includes uh, metastases, so bone metastases, uh, primary kidney cancer, pelvic nodes and mis miscellaneous oligomets. Um, so a standard lung oligomet fraction would be 28 gram one fraction. Uh, we do um, two fractions for our spines and, and bones. Um, when we're doing a retreatment, we will often do it in three fractions. Kidney metastases are three fractions. Um, 
uh, sorry, uh, liver metastases are three fractions, large kidneys and, and primary lung cancer is three fractions as well. Um, primary lung cancer near the chest wall will do with four fractions and then all of our uh, HCCs are uh, five fractions as well as central lung, pancreas and prostate. Um, so a bit of, bit of everything in terms of fractionation. We just try to have everything protocolized. That's the key thing. So you can see there are lots of tall columns here where we have pretty consistent fractionations. So I just want to sort of cover some key considerations in the SATA program uh, in, the, in the process before going into um, motion management and planning. So, so the first um, thing is we, we need to really immobilize our patients um, because we've, we've got small fields and we, we've got very tight geometric constraints, small margins. So mobilization is one of the first things um, that we need to consider getting right. And this is what we have been using um, up until this year. And it's a, it's a standard um, Sabre VAC bag. Um, we, we typically won't use this drape anymore unless um, we, we do think there's going to be quite a lot of respiratory motion and we won't be able to do gating, et cetera. But it adds about 10 minutes to our setup procedure, so we don't like to use it. And it makes the patient pretty cold because it's essentially a wind going through the, the, the patient's skin the whole treatment session. We've started moving to a, a, a purpose-designed um, modular system um, such as that shown here, and that's really speeding up our setup processes. The key thing with Sabre is that the patient's got to be comfortable, um, notwithstanding the arm position. No one's comfortable with their arms like, like that. Um, they've got to be stable and it's got to be reproducible. So if you can achieve that with your equipment, then I think you're a long way um, uh, towards getting good immobilization. So simulation imaging is, is really a fundamental part of the, the Sabre process and, and, it, and it really it, it leans on a lot of aspects of the treatment, um, including motion management and, and uh, delineation, et cetera. But it all, so, so you need to consider this um, in, in how you're actually going to treat the patient, how you're going to do your IGRT uh, and what motion management you're going to use because all that will determine what simulation imaging you need. So basically we need to match the imaging to our motion management. And so for example, if we're doing um, an ITV based concept where we're treating everywhere the tumor goes in a respiratory cycle, then we'll, we'll definitely need to have a measurement of that, such as a 4D CT. Um, and if we're doing a breath hold treatment, then we'll want to image in breath hold. So we want to really match what we're doing at treatment um, in simulation session. The other thing is if we're considering what image guidance we're going to be using at treatment, such as a, a 3D cone beam CT, which will be similar to an average of a 4D CT, we need to make sure that our imaging we do will be a good reference for our IGRT process. So any image we acquire at treatment to match the patient and set them up properly, that needs to be, um, we need to have a good reference to, to align the patient to. So really have a good, good, good hard think about how you're going to be treating the patients um, and that will determine what simulation imaging you need. Um, two mil slice thickness is pretty standard in Sabre these days. You've got small targets, so you need to have um, fine cut slice thickness. Um, for spine, Sabre will typically use a one mil slice thickness. PET, CT and MRI has, has a, a few key uses. One of them is, is delineating a spinal cord in vertebral Sabre. <clears throat> um, occasionally we'll be using 4D PET CT or a standard PET CT for other metastases, but usually our stereotactic um, frame of reference is our, our planning image. And so we like to draw the object as it's visible there um, and then use these just to help point us in the right direction. And we use IV contrast quite a lot now, um, mainly for abdominal, um, such as uh, liver and pancreas, it's, it's mandatory. And we've started doing a lot more in, in kidney as well now. Just trying to advance the slides, there we go. So just a bit more on IV contrast. So. A liver tumour on a non-contrast CT is almost impossible to see. Um, sometimes you can see some deformation and slight in, um, uh, hyperdensity or hyperdensity, but, but typically you can't really define the edge of it. So we really make use of the dual blood supply the liver has. Um, and and we, this is an example mm -hmm. of, of, the, um, of an HCC uh, contrast enhancement. You can see that uh, you can get an enhancement of the, the HCC tumour relative to the, to the surrounding uh, liver parenchyma um, through, through IV contrast and, and appropriate timing. The key with IV contrast in, in simulation CT is you, you, you know, a lot of centres don't have the ability to do that in, in the simulation CT. It makes your life a lot easier if you can do it because the registration, typically where you're using um, IV contrast and where you need it, the registration is really challenging if you can't replicate the patient position pose, respiratory phase, et cetera, um, between your simulation non-contrast CT and your, your IV contrast um, image. So if you're getting images from your diagnostic department, 
it's worth walking over there and, and having a chat to them and seeing how you can reproduce the conditions that you're doing in your simulation CT to minimise any registration errors. Because you can, you know, the fact that you can't actually see anything in your liver, apart from the edge of it and some vessels occasionally, means that it's going to be very challenging to register an object within that if you've got no uh, sort of anatomical landmark to drive that. So like any imaging um, that we're doing in addition to our simulation um, CTs, really do your best here to match the patient position um, to your simulation image because that will make your life a lot easier. A um, couple of examples of some uh, contrast CTs. So this is a, the tumour here. This is a, a, an HCC in arterial phase. And you can see there's blushing here where you've got an enhancement of the tumour relative to the surrounding parenchyma because the HCC takes up um, its blood through the, the, the uh, arterial phase uh, arteries as opposed to the surrounding liver. And then you can see a washout relative to the surrounding liver as that enhances through the portal vein. And you can see the challenge in actually trying to draw a line around this. And so early on in our process, we had a radiologist help us with most of our segmentations because there are some false negatives and false positives in, in contrast, particularly in HCC. So it's worth getting your radiologist to, to have a look at these with you. Um, liver metastases are a bit simpler. They just, um, you have a hypodense area in a portal venous CT. So quite often we'll only just do a portal venous CT um, to, in addition to our non-contrast CT. You can see, you can sort of see where it is most of the time, um, but you can't clearly draw a line around it. And I think that's where the contrast really just gives you the, the ability to draw a line around something and, and say, yes, this is a tumor I wanna treat. <clears throat> Um, image guidance. Um, so image guidance is probably the enabling technology for SABRE. SABRE probably um, wasn't, it wasn't really widespread, re widespreadly available until image guidance became, um, soft tissue image guidance was available on most Linux. And so the, the key driver for this has been home mean CT. Got an example here of a lung tumor um, that we've treated with SABRE on a standard fan beam CT. And this is the treatment home beam CT. And you can see that we can set the patient up pretty nicely. You can see the tumour really nicely and, and get them um, in a pretty accurate position reasonably quickly using a comb beam CT. Advances in, in treatment machines over the years have resulted in, in the ability to do 4D comb beam CT, um, breath hold comb beam CT, gated CT, CBCT. All of these options are really useful and we use them all depending on the motion management that we're using for our particular patient. Um, even if it's a bone target or you've got fiducial markers, we always will acquire a comb beam CT because even if we're matching using something else, such as fiducial markers on an X-ray or, or on a bone, et cetera, we like the comb beam CT to assess um, the position of our tumour and our organs at risk relative to our tumour so that we're not going to be overing it, overdosing an organ at risk if it's moved relative to our planning scan. We do use X-rays and fluoroscopy quite a bit. Um, and uh, they're quite useful when you've got radiopaque markers or bones. And we do use during treatment imaging quite a bit now as well. Um, so fluoroscopy or um, KV x-rays during treatment, if there's something we can see, that gives us another good um, sanity check that we're hitting the right spot during the beam on. Uh, we also will, it's, it's, it's worth looking at mid-treatment comb beam CTs or image guidance. If your treatments are going a, a long time, here's some data from our single fraction um, treatments where we'll typically take a comb beam CT halfway through treatment and you can see that most patients are within a couple of millimetres or most setups have we do have quite a few outliers um, depending on the scenario so we, we like to, to acquire these because um, a lot of patients will require a mid-treatment setup. Uh, treatment um, you need to consider who who will actually be there at treatment who's important to be there you don't want it too busy but you need the right people we still have a radiation oncologist matching all of our savers um, which, which does become quite a, a resource intensive task. We're working towards an RT doing a lot of centres in Australia will actually have the radiation therapist doing the matching. Physics we attend, we're, we're required for motion management and IGRT. Um, and we have started doing remote radiation oncologist matching um, through some, some video um, linkages, um, which has been necessitated by some COVID restrictions in terms of where our doctors can work. Um, this is how long our single fraction treatments take. So these are probably on the longer side. And each of these is a treatment technique from 3D conformal, BMAT, DCAT, IMRT. And you can see that we don't actually get many gains through going to arc-based treatments compared with 3D conformal in terms of treatment time. One of our key drivers in reducing our treatment time is using triple F. So we actually use that for nearly all our savers where, where available on our Linux. 
And quality assurance, um, just briefly, I, I won't cover too much on this, but the key is it's, it's, it's everybody's responsibility um, and it should encompass the whole treatment chain. So we spend a lot of time reviewing images used for treatment. Um, we have this paper here where we reviewed all, uh, all of our Ford ACT reviews and found we have a roughly 20% intervention rate in, in terms of advising on margins or a rescan for Ford ACTs because of artifacts such as this one here where the patient just stopped breathing while we're scanning through the tumour resulting in a, 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 an incorrect measurement of the, the tumor motion. Um, and so we spent a lot of time on, on, on plan checks, image checks, et cetera. Measurement QA, we don't do as much anymore. Um, we find uh, we've, we've got some pretty robust um, treatment templates um, and, and planning protocols. So we, we measure where required and where the key things are where, where things are new, um, such as our cardiac savers or pancreas or and we also measure all of our vertebral saver because it's quite critical to, to get that working and a number of different tools. Um, I won't go into the details here, but uh, we find use for nearly all of our measurement tools here. <clears throat> okay, so just doing a bit of a deep dive down into, into motion management and saver. And so there are a, a few key concepts here and, and I'm just gonna focus on these three on the right here. Um, so we've got an internal target volume. So essentially we measure everywhere where the tumor goes during respiration. And we put a large margin on that, um, covering everywhere it goes. And basically we treat everywhere the tumor goes and the patient just breathes normally. Um, when we're talking about uh, gating or tracking, essentially we're just trying to freeze the tumor at some phase of the breathing cycle, or if it's tracking, we're actually gonna have a small field just tracking the tumor the whole time. Um, so that results in a small volume um, being treated or the, the, the smallest amount required. And so this would be gated at exhale or breath hold or, or tracking. And then there's a, a concept that's a bit more common in Europe, which is mid-ventilation, which relies on probabilities of, of where the tumour is um, most of the time and, and the wider dose gradient in lung, lung saver in particular. I won't go into that in a lot of detail. So just getting a bit more into, into the detail of why we do do motion management. And the key thing is, Motion management is, is either measuring motion and, and, and just taking into account with larger fields, or it's doing something more advanced to take into to account the motion such that the total volume is reduced. Um, and that might be gating, tracking, et cetera. This is a paper by um, Vince Kay, uh, who was looking at MLC tracking, which you can consider probably equivalent to, um, to, to gating compared with the, the mid ventilation, which was that last option. And both of those compared with an ITV option and in lung saver, you can see that there actually aren't big gains to be made in terms of lung dosimetry. You've got quite large lungs and, and saver tumors are quite small. So you don't have large gains in terms of lung dosimetry. Where you get larger, the, the, the dominant gains is where you're treating central structures, um, serial structures. So in terms of our practice, we'd actually um, see a big gain in doing gating in lung saver unless uh, the patient might have um, like really substantial respiratory motion, or where there's multiple lesions that are all moving, or where it's gonna uh, significantly reduce dose to a, a critical structure that's usually a serial structure, um, such as one in the central lung. So we actually don't do a whole lot of gating because of this reason that the gains aren't there um, for, for lung dose alone. Um, one of the, the gains could be, however, this, this is a paper, a, a trial done in France a number of years ago um, that looked at DIVH as well as um, just free breathing respiratory gating. And they showed there was a reduction in acute toxicity, uh, thoracic to uh, pulmonary toxicity with gating methods that was mainly driven by deep inspiration techniques, um, which, um, which is where your lung volumes are really expanded. And so your total lung that's actually getting treated in these fields is, is reduced a lot. So there, there could be a role for, for um, DIBH and SABA. It, it is a bit more challenging though, given the, the um, reproducibility of breath hold in, in SABA it does need to be pretty tight. In liver, however, there's probably a, a really strong case to be made for motion management, um, advanced motion management, such as reducing the, the total volume. Um, livers move a lot because they're right under the diaphragm. In this particular study, we, we removed the motion. So we said, okay, if we can have zero respiratory motion through gating or tracking or breath hold, what is our PTV size reduction? So essentially, the more motion you can remove, um, the larger the PTV reduction, um, which is as we expect. But one of the follow-on effects from that is in, because in liver, we actually are limited by our 
surrounding liver dose. And if our liver dose gets too high, we have to drop the prescription dose um, according to all of our protocols that we follow. Excuse me. <coughs> so by reducing the PTV size, that reduces the liver dose. And by reducing the liver dose, we can actually maintain a high um, prescription dose to that target. And in liver metastases, where there is a definitely a, a dose response, in other words, the more tumor dose, the higher tumor control probability you have. We show that through motion management, reduction of motion through breath hold or gating, we can result in a, a BED increase in our, in our target, in our tumor. And that equates directly to a TCP increase, a tumor control probability, incre probability increase. So, so in liver saver, we really try and uh, apply advanced motion management to every single patient we can. ITVs um, is probably the, the, the most common way of doing motion management. And essentially that's just measuring the motion and taking it into account with the margin. And so this is our process here. We have a 4 CT. We, we drill down and we get something that's called a MIP um, and we'll draw a line around that called an ITV, an internal target volume. And then um, our PTV is on top of that. And essentially we just treat everywhere the tumor is moving during respiration. This works for all patients. Um, it's very easy to get a 4 CT these days um, and it's very uh, efficient at delivery because you just put the patient on, they breathe, you match to a blurred tumor or you can use 4 day cone beam to match to a, a, a static phase. Um, but it does result in the largest treated volume. So we do do this most of the time for our patients in lung. Breath hold is, is, is a bit more challenging. So here's where we're trying to get the patient to, to reproducibly hold their breath. And I've got this patient here, this is a liver um, target. And so we'll use fluoroscopy to assess this. And we get to get the patient to breathe normally. And then when we say hold, they'll breathe out and they'll just hold there. And this, this is fluoroscopy of four repeat breath holds showing this patient could actually breathe uh, hold their breath very reproducibly. Um, and so this requires a lot of patient interaction and training, um, but it does significantly reduce the, the, the motion to, to essentially a zero motion if they can do it reproducibly, but it's not applicable to all patients. Uh, gating is essentially the patient breathes regularly and you just turn the beam on and off um, when they're in the, the right or wrong phase of the breathing cycle. So here we typically do this and exhale, results in a similar target volume to, to um, a, free, a, a breath hold, but you can actually do some, some nice things in, in terms of you could do a, a say a 50% duty cycle and only treat when they're in the bottom half of their breathing cycle here around exhale, which, which reduces motion, but it still keeps a reasonable beam on time. So you can play around with different duty cycles there, but it does require a very reproducible and regular breathing trace because if they're all over the, the respiratory trace is very irregular, then you're, you're not gonna have much luck with um, getting treatment done efficiently. <clears throat> Tracking I'll cover briefly. It's where you, you cover the, the, treat the tumor wherever where it goes during respiration with a small field. Um, so the, the, the beam would actually track it. This is an MLC tracking process. Um, essentially the same as breath hold and, and gating in terms of target volumes, but it does require a lot of specialist equipment such as cyber knife, the signal for respiratory motion does require motion prediction because otherwise the lag between the the beam moving and the, the tumor is, is too, too slow. Um, and it's, but it is suitable for most patients. So unlike gating and breath hold where you need reproducible breathing or, or compliance with, from the patient, um, essentially the patient just gets on and they breathe normally and you just track wherever it goes. And again, similar target volume as gating or breath hold, but not wide, widely available. You need special, specialist equipment for this. And then there's a very simple method called um, abdominal compression you could be have a plate like this or a band like this <clears throat> it can have quite quite significant reductions in, in basically compressing the diaphragm motion so it limits the respiratory motion uh, and then you just measure how much motion there is with, with the, the abdominal compression in place and use an ITV to cover that <clears throat> it does also squash organs against tumors so we don't use it for pancreas for example it's not comfortable for the patient. If you've got a colostomy bag, it doesn't work. Prone doesn't work. And it can have some um, variations set up reproducibly, partic reproducibility, particular with um, this sort of compression plate. We find we need to assess patients on a per patient basis as to whether a compression does anything. Here's some data we looked at for the compression band. Some patients, it actually increases motion. Some patients, it has a significant reduction in motion. Others, not much difference at all. So you need to assess per patient. Um, 
here's our motion management workflow for livers. We have a separate mock-up session prior to our CT simulation, just so we can assess what motion management is suitable for them. And then that carries through to our simulation session and then to our treatment. Our first step is patient education, which is, which is pretty critical. Um, and, and we basically instruct the patient and, and give them a couple of sessions to, to do this from, from, the, from the initial clinic visit onwards. <clears throat> we'll then test whether they can do that. Um, if they can do more than a 15 second exhale breath hold as judged using our um, body surface um, box, then we'll, we'll, we'll continue. If they can't do breath, if, if they can do a breath hold consistently, sorry, this seems to be frozen. Um, Bear with me, my PowerPoint's frozen. I'll let that catch up. If they can do a breath hold, um, what we'll do is we'll proceed to doing ant post fluoroscopy and measure the position of the diaphragm or the liver dome um, on repeat exhale breath holds. And if they can do that consistently as judged on the anatomy, then we'll continue and have that for our CT simulation session. If they can't do that consistently, or if they couldn't do breath hold from the start, then we'll do some ant post fluoroscopy and assess their, their free breathing motion, apply our abdominal compression, measure the, the, the breathing motion again. And if we have a substantial reduction in, in liver dome motion for abdominal compression, they'll have that for simulation and treatment. Otherwise, we'll just treat them in free breathing with an ITV. Works out about two thirds of patients have a breath hold, um, about 10% have abdominal compression or abdominal compression works for them and they're comfortable with it. And the rest have a, uh, just an ITV on free breathing. Sorry, my, uh, I'm just going to just stop sharing for a second because my PowerPoint's completely frozen. Sorry, I'm having to do a force shutdown here. And not shut down. Okay, I'll just bring the PowerPoint back up. <clears throat> Are you okay now? Um, yeah, I'm just going to go yeah. to pass that slide so that I can continue. We have a few more minutes and then we can go to questions. Yeah, uh, okay. Not... Okay. I'll, uh... I'm sorry, I can't get my PowerPoint to work to actually function at all now. That's okay. Um, were you almost done? We can we can go to Q and A. Yeah. Um, you want to <coughs> try one one more time? I um, I will try one more time. I just wanted to show one or two more slides about treatment plans, and then we can go to Q and A. Okay, sorry about that. I had to restart a couple of times. Okay, just in terms of treatment planning, um, the key things I want to just highlight is ICIU 91. Um, ICIU, you guys can see that? Yes. 
ICIE 91 has a fantastic cover uh, coverage of, of all uh, saver prescriptions, etc. Dose calculation, I'm assuming Lottie will cover a lot more detail than what I will. The key thing is here, as, as a group at the Moffat has shown, um, it does actually matter to use the right dose calculation algorithm in SABRE, one that in, accounts for um, both, both primary and, and scattered radiation heterogeneity effects. And there's a list of some of them here, and IROC in the US has a very good list uh, that's, that's updated. But essentially they show that if, if they use pencil beam um, compared with their collapsed cone convolution, Patients treated with pencil beam um, had a, a, about a 10% higher chance of, of uh, local failure because the pencil beam wasn't telling them the, the accurate dose and they're actually underestimating the dose to these patients. So it does matter you use the right dose calculation algorithm. Um, dose, calc uh, dose treatment planning in SABRE is, is usually something that looks like this. It's, it's, a, it's a small target surrounded by mostly parallel organs. Fundamentals of this are you typically have ipsilateral beam angles. You need to have at least seven to nine beam angles, really limit um, the skin dose from any one beam when they ran into problems early on in Sabre was because they were trying to get all the dose in through three to five beams, which resulted in horrific skin effects. So you really spread the dose out through at least 180 degrees of arc length <clears throat> or seven to nine conformal beams or, or MIT beams. Non-complainer beams can be useful. Typically when we're modulating, we don't need them. And in lung tumors, we, we, we wouldn't really go above 6MV for, for dose calculation accuracy reasons. Um, and this is what dose distributions look like. Um, but prescription isodose line hugging the PTV, we allow the dose to go up to 120, 130% in the GTV. And uh, uh, because that allows us to really drop the dose off outside the target, which is one of the key things in SABRE in that you have a a peak dose distribution in the middle of your target and drop the dose off as quickly as possible outside your target, something like this. It's been described as looking like a fried egg, which is a good way to describe it. I think uniformly dropping off outside the, our target here. If you've got a critical organ that's immediately adjacent, such as in the vertebral sabre, we always prioritize that over target coverage and let the 50% isodose line go off um, and, and, and not look as pretty as this um, by when we have to really prioritize a critical organ adjacent to it. So it depends on what's really around it. If, it, if you've got completely homogenous, uh, sorry, parallel organs such as lung or liver around your target, it'll look something like this. If, it's got, if you've got a critical organ immediately adjacent, then you'll need to really prioritize that over your target. <clears throat> Given the time, I'll probably just stop here um, and take questions um, because, I think I'm sitting a bit over and I apologize for those challenges with the PowerPoint. I think I've got too many slides or animations I just didn't like. <laughs> um, I will go to a summary slide and leave this up on the screen while I take questions. Talking about liver, have you uh, used triggered imaging? Um, yeah, for yeah we, we, okay. How often we, do you we use, use it? Quite that? a bit. So, so the liver, um, we have about half of our patients are HCCs. In our particular referral process, our, our HCCs have usually been heavily pre treated before they come to us TACE, RFA, etc. So about um, uh, one third of our HCCs that we're treating have had previous taste. So there'll be a lipidol left over, which is really shows up really nicely on CT and, and planar imaging. Um, so we'll use it from whenever there's a lipidol, we'll, we'll try and image that during triggered image dur during the beam on. Um, we don't use fiducials routinely. Uh, we try to get away without it. And we think we're comfortable with our IGRT without fiducial markers, apart from pancreas, where we do um, use fiducials for all of our patients um, and, and prostate as well. And in those cases, we'll actually acquire triggered imaging either linked to the respiratory trace or just every 100 or so MUs um, or X amount of seconds, um, 10, five to 10 seconds, and we'll, we'll use the, the actual marker match and it'll tell us whether the markers are in the right spot or not. So we, we've looked at a little bit for, for liver dome as well, and that can be useful. Um, so it just depends on whether you think there'll be something to see on the triggered imaging that, that you think will be worthwhile um, to see during treatment. But you still use the respiratory trace with the triggered imaging? Or uh, a bit, a, yeah, a bit of a mix. Yeah, typically. So, okay. so what we'll try and do is um, we'll, we'll, if it's a free breathing gating, we'll actually set the trigger to acquire an image every time the patient enters the, the exhale window and snap an image every time the beam comes on. 
and I had a lung image there of the triggered imaging and, and it shows if you can see that tumour and you're gating, gated ITV every time you um, turn the beam on, it's really reassuring. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, that would be cool. I guess, I guess one, just finish that off, the, the one challenge is decision-making process. You, you, you need to have a clear process as to what you do when you see it actually looking not aligned with your target. So that, that, that's right. one thing we've, we've struggled with a bit, I think. Okay. And um, one more. Let's see. Do, do we have a look uh, at that question? A, yes. Can you read it? Yeah, sure. So the question is, okay. do we have to commission separate small beam data for Sabre? I think it depends on your planning system and, and what you're treating. So um, I'll, I'll give you a, a sort of an example of our, our center. We have at our main campus, a true beam STX, which is only used to deliver Sabre and SRS treatments. All of our SRS is done in iPlan, which is specifically small field um, commissioned. And all of our Sabre is done in, um, an eclipse in our Sabre beam, our, our beam model in, in, in that, in terms of our uh, uh, dosimetric leaf gap and, and transmission, et cetera, that's all weighted towards it being small fields. So typically um, three to five centimetres is how we've commissioned um, and, and weighted our, our DLG so that our, our passing rates are good for that. On our other Linux, on our standard true beams, we treat everything on them, not just Sabre. And so in those cases, we still have a beam model that is preference more towards a smaller field. So it's more towards the five to seven uh, centimeter field size, because that's still a sort of a typical radiotherapy field size, particularly when we're talking about a modulated treatment. So, so no, we don't have specific, for, for our standard true beams, what we use for, for all of our radiotherapy, we don't have specific small field um, beam models. We, we just um, weight our, our, our complete beam model towards the smaller end of the spectrum when we're doing our modeling. So it means if we do say an arc check measurement on a large field, the passing rate won't be as good as what if we do it for a small field. So it just depends um, on what you're actually treating on that machine, I think. <clears throat> okay, I have another question. It's about the reproducibility with compression belts. What's been your experience? What are the challenges and do you avoid yeah, using them? I don't or? like the belts, yeah. Okay, <laughs> the, yeah. The belt, yeah, the belt I find um, a couple of challenges. One is it doesn't compress that much. Um, so, so it, and, and it really depends on how, how much the, the, the RTs have actually tightened the belt first before they start pumping it up. And if they haven't tightened it a lot first, then you can pump it up as much as you want and it's not going to compress. The second thing is when you put it on, it can actually rotate around the patient quite a bit and they, they you can you can line it up with a laser on the on the plate, um, and so it looks good. But then you start pumping it up, and, and sometimes it can drift off to the side. And if you do that, it can actually push the anatomy around in different ways. So we've seen the liver sort of rotated around, and it really stuffs up your IGRT. So I haven't we haven't had a good experience with the compression bands. We do have a compression plate now with our, our newer mobilization equipment that we're we're looking to to get. Um, to, to start using because I think it's probably quite a bit more reproducible. Saying that, I still think it's probably only five to set, five to ten percent of patients will actually benefit from that. Yeah, um, yeah we try and keep them going through breath hold at first, and, and then there, there, there are some patients that makes a great difference for. So it's worth having in your toolkit. It just depends on on um, your assessment as to whether it works for them. Okay, one quick question. Last question. Um, about the body fix, the vacuum system, um, do you use it for your spine uh, treatments or how regularly or do you, do you are you, you know, yes. what's your so, routine so, setup? Um, so we'll use that back bag for all of our sabers um, in the city. All of them, our, not just spine. Main okay. No, no, all, okay. all of them, yep. Um, the, where we have it at other campuses, it's a bit of a mix, but typically even within that, um, the Freedom X, which is the other immobilization equipment we'll have, we'll have a VAC bag within that. Um, and we find for the spines um, that if we can get them through quickly, particularly we're starting to treat a lot more metastases that are painful. So more like a palliative treatment with Sabre. Um, and we need to just get them through quickly and, and um, to minimize the time they're on the couch because they're usually in pain. And so, uh, we are sort of working towards a bit more that the, the back bag can be a bit slow and it can be a bit harsh 
a, a bit a bit hard for the patient. So that that's the only limitation. But but in general, we'll we'll try and mobilise them as much as possible, and it'll it'll usually sort of the bag will usually come up to sort of halfway between the the patient's and post surface. So they're they're quite locked in. Okay, thank you very much, Nick. That was very useful. We yeah, actually, uh, yeah. So uh, we we are. I'm sure we're going to benefit from this a lot, and we'll probably have more questions for you later on. Yeah, yeah. Play, play, yeah. Please send any questions. Happy to okay. chat to anybody. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, we are ready for our second talk. Um, this is going to be by Miss uh, Lottie Fogg. Um, she is a medical physics. Uh, she has medical physics um, accreditations in Australia and Denmark. Her special interests include QA and error prevention in radiation therapy, total body radiation, brachytherapy, palliative RT, cervical cancer, teaching and technical limitations of different treatment planning systems and more. Uh, so we're going to continue the SABRE theme and she will be talking about the treatment planning algorithm, um, AAA versus Acuros. All right, I'm just going to try and share my screen. And can you guys see that? Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. <clears throat> so thank you for the introduction. And I also wanted to thank the organizing committee for um, asking me to talk at the Shogar Karam uh, Symposium. It's my third symposium and it's a little privilege to be able to participate in it today. So my topic, as you said, is algorithms with a particular focus on Acuros and on the migration from AAA to Acuros. And I want to touch on algorithms in general and once we've discussed them a little bit, I want to talk more about Acuros in particular. What are the special things that you should have in mind when you use Acuros? And once we've covered that, I want to go on and talk about a range of anatomical sites and what Acuros plans look like. We'll be starting off with lung, but also covering esophagus, bone and other sites. And we'll end up with a summary and some suggestions for additional reading if anybody would like to go away and read more. So <clears throat> really briefly, the uh, algorithm in the treatment planning system, of course, calculates the dose in the patient resulting from the effluence that enters into the patient. And the development we've seen over the last couple of decades is that the algorithms we use have become a lot more accurate, um, in part because of software development and in part because of more powerful computers being available. And the primitive algorithms that we had 10, 15 years ago, such as the pencil beam algorithm, um, which crucially doesn't really account for lateral scatter and density changes very well, are not very widely used anymore in dose calculations. I would like to just point out that the pencil beam algorithm if you're an eclipsed person, actually gets used, it rears its head in two different uh, parts of the eclipse planning system. And the first place that we still use pencil beam in modern day eclipse is that when you optimize a plan for IMRT or BMAT, then in the optimizer window, you're looking at your priorities, your objectives and your predicted DVHs. And those DVHs are predicted using pencil beam. So if you've got a scenario where pencil beam doesn't do so well, then at the end of the optimization, when your planning system goes away and calculates the dose with the clinical algorithms or with Acuros, you might get a final DVH which looks quite different from what you saw during the optimization. If that's what's going on, then you might be much better off if you tick the box that says use intermediate dose calculation in your optimization, because that will then force the optimization halfway through to stop using pencil beam and to calculate the dose deposition using Acuros. And it's even better than that because for the second half of the optimization, the optimizer will actually take into account the difference between the predicted DVHs using pencil beam and the actual DVHs calculated with Acuros. So if you've got a scenario where Acuros is quite different from pencil beam, the intermediate dose calculation is a powerful tool to limit the harm done by pencil beam in your optimization. The second place that we use pencil beam in a modern day clips is if you do your quality assurance using portal symmetry, so variant zone um, quality assurance tool. If you use portal to symmetry, then you're comparing a measured dose with a dose calculated not with the clinical algorithm, but with the pencil beam type algorithm. So crucially, pencil beam also pops up in portal to symmetry. And that means that if you do portal to symmetry type verification, 
then you're verifying your delivery, but you're not verifying your clinical algorithm. So I just wanted to put that out there that pencil beam, although we don't use it very much, it still appears from time to time. So what happened in the evolution of algorithms is pencil beam got replaced by more complicated things like collapse cone and superposition convolution. So that would be um, things like and our gold standard in dose calculation, of course, is Monte Carlo modeling, which models the photons one by one. But generally speaking, it's still too time consuming to be in routine clinical use. Monte Carlo modeling, as I said, model the photons one by one. Um, and uh, the dose deposition is described by the linear Boltzmann transport equation. And what Acuras does is it solves that transport equation numerically. What that means is that the dose deposition that Aculus gives us is very similar to the dose deposition that we get from Monte Carlo modeling. A little bit more about exactly what Aculus does. The dose calculation happens in four separate steps. In step one, we've got the transport of fluids from um, the LINAC into the patient. In step two, we've got the calculation of the photon fluids inside the patient. In step three, we've got the calculation of the electron fluence inside the patient. Those are the electrons released by the photons. And in step four, we've got the dose calculation. And so if we've got an IMRT plan with a number of fields or a VMAT plan with a number of control points, then step one is done once for each IMRT beam or once for each VMAT control point. And steps two to four is done, are done only once for the entire plan. And generally, <clears throat> what we find with Acuros is that if you're doing inverse type planning, then the calculation time required for Acuros is actually quite a bit less than the calculation time required for AAA. The exact difference in time depends on your computer space. Before we start to talk about more about differences in algorithms, I thought I would just highlight another thing if the users, if the people who are logged on today aren't all Eclipse users, because one thing is the algorithm that the treatment planning system uses. But something else that's important is the optimizer itself. And on the right, you can see an example of a patient who had a VMAT plan made in Monaco and an Eclipse. And what you find is that VMAT plans are constructed by the optimizer. You end up with a certain number of monotunes per gray and a certain number of beams. And if you make a VMAT plan in Monaco, then your plan will end up with a lot more arcs and a lot more monotunes per gray than the same patient anatomy optimized in Eclipse. So one thing is the um, algorithms that we use, but another thing that will give rise to different types of plans is actually the, optimizing, the optimizers that are used as you construct your plans in the inverse planning process. One of the things that becomes important with Acuros is that <clears throat> is the way it handles heterogeneities. And if you've got a superposition convolution algorithm like AAA, heterogeneities are typically handled in a density based in a density um, based way. Whereas Acuros doesn't really care about the density of what you're calculating of your, of your patient CT data. It wants to know what the materials are. It models the physical interaction and it needs to know the chemical composition of your patient. And on the right there, you can see a window from Eclipse that shows you what different materials Acuros knows about that you might find inside your patient. So there's a material table. Um, and if the densities of your CT data is below three grams per cubic centimeter in Eclipse, then when you use Acuros, it'll quite automatically go in and assign materials to that box of a particular density. It'll do that automatically, but once your density hits three grams per cubic centimeter or more, then it doesn't quite know what to assign and it will actually prompt you and say, I've got this high density volume, what is it? And it'll ask you to choose from that list that you can see there, what is it that you've got in your patient CT set. The maximum density that Acuros can handle is eight grams per cubic centimeter. So if you're unlucky enough that your patient has some material inside him that is heavier than eight grams per cubic centimeter, you'll have to approximate it with the heaviest material that you have in your material table. And you'll have to know that what you're calculating isn't quite as accurate as what it could be because it's beyond the ability of the TPS to deal with quite such things and volumes inside the patient. So if you have something that has a high density, Acuros or Eclipse will say to you, what is that? And that could be things like surgical clips for a prostate patient or a post-surgical patient. It could be dental fillings, it could be artificial hips, it could be a lot of different things. And the easiest way to deal with this in Eclipse is to use a tool called segment high density artifacts. 
basically, if you do that, then you define a volume of interest and you ask Eclipse to, to, to segment to the control the high density artifacts. So you could segment, you could define a bit around the dental cap, the dental filling that you've got, and then <clears throat> Eclipse will auto contour it and then you can assign it the density that you think it should have. If you're lucky enough that your patient has, say, two different um, dental fillings of different densities, you can define two different regions of interest and assign two different densities to it. To them. We also need to briefly touch on the issue of dose to water versus dose to medium. And if you do calculations with Monte Carlo or with Acuras, then you, the user, have to choose between a dose to water approach or a dose to medium approach. But typically, this is something that would be chosen as the TPS is commissioned and the user wouldn't change it, but it is something that the user has the ability to change in the planning system. Explaining what it is gets a bit hairy. I will um, simply say that the <clears throat> if you use a dose to water approach, then the electron fluence in a particular voxel <clears throat> is calculated based on that voxel's actual material, but the dose that's deposited assumes that the voxel is made of water. And if you've got a dose to medium approach, then the dose to the true medium is actually calculated. So this is a choice that you make when you configure your TPS. You can also make it in planning. And um, really, I think the jury is out on what we should be doing in terms of dose to water versus dose to medium. Here's a couple of references that talk about what you should be using. The top one is Varian's own guide that recommends that we should be using dose to medium. Um, because particularly if you use dose to water near high Z materials, you can get an overestimation of dose of up to 10%. Um, there's a couple of other references here that you can go away and read about. But there's been quite a lot of work done to show that dose to medium will give you a much more accurate um, dose calculation than to use Aquinas or Monte Carlo. How much does it really matter? Well, this is a picture of a slab phantom. We've got a slab phantom made up of soft tissue, bone, lung, and soft tissue again. And what you can see is in the slab that is bone, then you've got an overestimation if you use the um, dose to water approach compared with the um, EGSN, um, EGSNRC, which is the Monte Carlo calculation um, or the um, dose to medium approach. You get this quite large overestimation of dose, which is greater for the higher energy beams um, and which is not what is correct if you compare with measurement either. You might think, well, my patient's not a slab phantom. And this is an example of a clinical case where you've got dose to water on the left and dose to medium on the right. And in this patient with lung cancer, you can see that if you use a dose to water approach, then you appear to have much better coverage of your PTV than you do if you use a dose to medium approach. And the dose to medium approach in this case, it's more correct. So beware if you use a dose to water approach, you're probably going to see doses that look rather better and at least in lung than what they actually are. Another couple of things about Acuros that I'd like to direct your attention to, just like um, AAA, you calculate the dose uh, on a voxel basis, but you can choose smaller voxels. You can choose grid sizes down to about one millimeter or down to one millimeter. Um, whereas with AAA, they could be, I should have said 2.5 to five mils. And you should care about your grid size because if your target is very small or if your plan is very modulated, that is to say it's got a very high number of monotunes per gray, well, then the dose distribution that you calculate will depend on the grid size that you use. So you might like to play around if you've got small targets. You might like to calculate that with a small grid size and the standard clinical grid size, which is probably around about two and a half mils. And if you see that there is a difference in the dose distribution, depending on the grid size, then it is a smaller grid size calculation that is more correct. After a while, you'll develop some sort of feel for just what is a very modulated plan in terms of when does the grid size matter and what is a very small target in terms of when does the grid size matter. But it's something you should have at the back of your mind as you make plans or as you check plans. The varying recommendation is that your grid size should be a multiple of the MLC width. So in this case, typically that would be a grid size of either two and a half mils or 1.25 mils. The other wonderful thing I would say at this point about Acuras is that if you're doing inversely planned cases, then Acuras typically will be quite a bit faster than AAA. Which is nice, particularly if you haven't got unlimited access to the planning system. <clears throat> so we get back to the question of how much it really matters. 
which algorithm you use. And there is a wealth of literature out there and you can see it at the, in slides on exactly what difference it makes when you use different algorithms. On the right there, you've got one example. At the top, we've got Colette Cone. In the middle, we've got Accurus. And at the bottom, we've got AAA. And you can see that the isodose lines are a little bit different. And this becomes important in terms of what your requirements are for covering the PTD, of course. I'd now like to move on and talk a little bit about particular anatomical sites. And I thought we might start with lung, because that is one of the cases that people possibly uh, start out by uh, being a bit concerned about. And it has been well shown in the literature that there are quite considerable differences between the coverage of AAA and the vacuous for a lot of lung patients because of the low density of tissue that typically sit in the periphery of your PTB. The doses calculated with Acuros are lower, and they can be lower by as much as 10 or 12%. So it's actually really important in terms of how your radiation oncologist will feel about the plan that you show him or her. But the key take home point here is that the doses that you calculate with Acuros agree better with Monte Carlo calculations, and they agree better with measurements. They are actually quite a bit more accurate. I'll show you a couple of examples. This is uh, in the top. This image, we've got what you might like to call your worst case scenario. So we've got a small, fairly centrally located lung tumor, and we've got a PTV contour, and we've got the isodose lines with Acuros and AAA. And what you can see, particularly if you look on the right and look at the DDHs, is that your coverage of this tumor is rather poor with Acuros than it is with AAA. Case B is a bit nicer. We've got a slightly bigger tumor that doesn't sit quite so centrally. And for case B, we've got a much, much smaller difference between AAA and Aculus. So this is something you can use practically in the clinic when you make the transition from AAA to Aculus. You can actually predict with a reasonable amount of certainty the cases where you'll see a considerable difference between AAA and Aculus. This is helpful when you have to explain to your radiation oncologist that the those distribution that they're about to see will probably not quite be what they were used to seeing with AAA. Um, and it'll probably look worse, particularly if it's a case A type scenario. And if they still struggle to understand what they should make of this altered dose distribution, then particularly at the beginning of your Acuros journey, it can be useful to calculate both with AAA and with Acuros. So you can show your oncologist both calculations show them what they're used to seeing and remind them that actually the coverage is, is a little bit less good than what they've been used to um, expecting. There's another couple of examples. At the top there, we've got a stage one tumor and um, it's fairly small. And we see again quite a bit of difference um, between AAA and Acuros. And we see very little difference in this case between Acuros with a good size of one mil and Acuros with a good size of two and a half mil. The second example in this slide, the stage three tumor, we see a much smaller difference between AAA and Acuros, but a bit more of a dependence on grid size. Like I said, the dependence on grid size will in part be driven by the target size, but also in part be driven by the modulation of the plan. So if you've got, if you've got a very modulated plan with a very high number of monotunes per gray, you would expect that type of plan to be more sensitive to the grid size that you choose. So that was lung. Um, lung, of course, isn't the only place where we see differences between AAA and Acuros. Another site that uh, we'll see fairly big differences is esophagus, for the same reason. This is an esophageal case, um, and because the esophagus is such a mobile organ, you've typically got fairly generous PTV margins, and they typically encompass lung tissue. And here we've got um, acidos uh, wash on the left with AAA and on the right with Acuros, and um, the same thing applies. What you see is that the periphery of the PTV will appear to be less well covered with um, Acuros than it will with AAA. And again, for the same reason. So this is another case where you can predict that your DVHs will look less good once you start using Acuros. Moving on from esophagus, and this slide is courtesy of Pick. Again, this is a, an example where we've got a small lung tumor and we see that the periphery of the lung tumor is less well covered once we make the transition from AAA to Acuros. The DVH has much more of a short range. Uh, this is another example, again, of a slightly bigger tumor located in a slightly better spot in terms of coverage. But again, we see that with Acuros, we don't get quite the same peripheral coverage as we've gotten used to with AAA. So we know what to expect in lung. Another site that sees a bit of a um, coverage dependence on algorithm is bone. 
and this is another image uh, courtesy of Nick where we've got different um, doses with triple A and Acuras and what we see is that the bone dose is actually a bit higher with Acuras. So whereas in lung we get poorer coverage, in bone we get a greater, a greater amount of hotspots. So we see a greater heterogeneity in the dose once we start to use Acuras. There's a whole bunch of other sites. Pretty much every site will be affected to some extent by the choice of algorithm. And there's a lot of papers that you can go over and read. And they will generally say that there's a difference between the algorithms, particularly if you've got density changes. So if your target includes air or lung tissue or bone or other high set materials, that's where you'll be expecting to see the bigger differences. But even for non-thoracic tumors like gynae or prostate, you'll see differences. And one of the places that you might see uh, differences is if you've got a prostate case where the PTD includes perhaps a small air pocket that sits in the rectum, an air cavity or a gas pocket that sits in the rectum. If you calculate that with AAA, it'll probably give you quite a nice dose distribution. But if you calculate that with Acuros, then Acuros will say that that air, air pocket will not be covered as well by dose. If that's a problem for your radiation oncologist, you can point out that the air pocket might well not be there during treatment. And you can point out that if it's replaced by soft tissue, then that is likely to be more covered in your actual calculation. Um, you also see differences for things like head and neck, where again, in the bony part of the head and neck, you'll see greater hotspots. And if you've got some air pockets in your head and neck, then again, you'll see cold spots, if, which can be a problem if they're part of your PT. And my talk is a bit shorter than Nick's. Um, that was the end. It was perhaps a bit quick. Are there any questions? Okay, that was that was really helpful. Um, let me see if I have any questions. No question. I actually have a question. So you know, we just um, you just mentioned that obviously, if it's a, a small tumor in the middle of the lung, you would due to lack of electronic equilibrium lateral equilibrium, you will have issues. How do you compensate for that? Let's say if the, you know, radiation oncologist wants that coverage, you know, and the PTV is not, you know, which is a very common scenario and they want good coverage. How do you, what are your planning techniques that, you know, you would use to do that? So that, that's a problem I've seen in multiple clinics and you can start by explaining to them that the poor coverage that they're seeing it's probably the poor coverage they've had in the years past when they've been looking at AAA plans, they just didn't know it. So the clinical outcomes that they've seen in the last number of years with AAA are the clinical outcomes that are probably tied to what they're looking at right now if your planning technique hasn't changed very much. You can tell them that if they want more coverage, it'll be difficult to achieve because it's just hard to get scattered dose in given the lung tissue that surrounds the tumor. You can increase the number of monotubes and pump more dose in, but that will also increase the doses to your organs at risk. So that's a choice that your oncologist has to make. If they want better apparent coverage, then it'll mean a higher dose to the organs at risk. But it's crucial that they understand that if you haven't changed your planning technique, then the poor coverage that they see is what they should have seen in the years past, they just didn't know it. It can be a really big educational help to calculate your plan in AAA as well and show them that this is what it would have looked like last week. But now we know it looks like this and this is actually more correct but it's a choice that they can make, but, it, but it's helpful that you guide them. Exactly. And, you know, this comes up a lot during SABRE because this is something we're, you know, we're starting new and, you know, we've never treated this, this small tumors. So that's where it, you know, mostly would come up during uh, SPRT lung treatments. So do you, do you accept the lower, like you, you were, they would accept the lower coverage to the PTV? You should definitely have a conversation with your oncologist about what are their accepting, what are their criteria for accepting a plan. Exactly. And yes, you might well need to change it. Um, if your tumor is small and the coverage is poor, you might like to try and calculate it with a finer grid size. You might find that if your tumor is very small, then you get volume averaging across the voxels and you might actually get slightly better coverage if you calculate it with a finer grid size as well. So that's another thing you can try before you have that conversation with the oncologist. Yes, you should have that conversation and they might need to change their, their criteria for what they accept. Absolutely. Okay, I have a couple of more questions. Uh, 
There is a question due to high density material in the body, sometimes accuracy calculations fail, even though high segmentation tool was used. So what, generally, what's the strategy then? So if there is a high density material in your CT scan, then Eclipse will say to you, look, it's more than three grams per cubic centimeter, help tell me what it is. And then you can assign to it a material from your list of, of allowed materials. Um, you can't choose a material with a density that's greater than eight grams per cubic centimeter. So but if you choose one of those materials, then it should actually work. It should actually not give you an error. I'm not quite sure what the error message was that the question was about. I think that's where it, it, it wants you to assign a density. In my experience, that's when, so once you assign the density, you have to choose it from the list. And once you assign it, then it will. And I think what I've noticed is you sometimes have to make sure your, uh, the material is not like crossing the bound, like your body out, you know, your uh, body contour. Yes. It's within that because then again, it would not calculate. If it's outside your body contour, it doesn't calculate yes. it at all, then it doesn't actually care. So that's, so if you've got like maybe a small metal bearing on the top of your patient's surface, the other thing you can do instead of assigning a material is you can pull your body surface in a tiny bit by a mill and then you don't have a problem. That's another way around it. Okay. The person, uh, the same, uh, another question from the same person, it's related due to high density, even though high, uh, high segmentation tool was used, it still doesn't work even when they assign the material. Um, can I maybe ask that person to email me the exact error message that they're getting after this talk and I will talk to them and see. If One attendee has asked, is, is, could that be a reason? Um, the reason that it's not calculated, could it be the reason that the TPS was not commissioned using denser materials? I think if you go through commissioning Acuros, then you need to have a material table and that has to be in there. So no, I don't think that can be a reason. Mm -hmm. It's a bit hard to tell without knowing the precise error message, but please send it to me and I'll help resolve it. Okay. Yeah. And then I think one of the things right, what I've, I've faced is you have to make sure your, the material that you've outlined stays inside the body contour because I've had, you know, I've been trying to calculate and it won't. And then sometimes see, okay, there was just one little bit outside. So that might help, but yeah, um, we'll have them send you questions. Sure. I have another question. Do those calculation algorithms always need high performance computing? <laughs> oh, that's that, that that's hard to answer. Um, high performance computers will make it faster. So it depends how many plans you need to make, what computer power you have available, how many hours in the day you have to make plans. It's, I guess it's a compromise at the site where you are. Um, obviously, the better a computer you can lay your hands on, the, the faster you can make your plans. Um, but you have to work with what you have. And I've seen places where the planners had lots of access to, to, um, to, to high performance computers and it wasn't a problem. And I've seen places where the planners had access to a single computer and they had a whiteboard where they would write their name. And then when that top person had finished, it would be the next person's turn. It just depends on what you, what you can do and what you have available. And I think what you have available also dictates how much of what you do becomes Saber and Beam at NIMRT and how much of it is 3D CRT. It depends on many local things. But certainly it helps. Uh, the next part of the question uh, from the same person is, um, is the reason why a TPS cannot calculate dose using a material denser than eight grams per cubic centimeter due to a limitation inherent in the algorithm? Okay, I so think that's it's the same question, yeah. <laughs> so that's a choice made okay. by Varian. It simply said that that's the upper limit on the density that they can deal with. Um, it's greater than it was in previous versions of the clips. So yes. if you like, we'll right. more flexible. Um, and if you were to look into the future, perhaps that limit will go up even more. But it's basically very insane that the algorithms that they've got, or the algorithm that they've got, isn't very accurate beyond that. And so they limit the maximum density to do that. Um, it means that if you're unlucky enough to have a very high density object inside your, your patient, you might need to try and make sure your beam arrangement doesn't come in through it. Yeah, just try to avoid that, going through that. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we used to do. And like, you know, when we didn't have all this sophisticated algorithms, just not go try to avoid. Yeah, I think that that's it with the questions. Anything else? Any other since we we have uh, about like nine minutes, anything else you would like to share your experiences um, with planning? Uh, 
in the, the, the favor. The main, the main thing that, that, that can be tricky is when you change algorithms, um, particularly from, from AAA to Actros, but it was a similar thing from Pennsylvania to AAA, is that your oncologist suddenly is appalled at the plans that are made and they want you to make it as nice as it used to be. So it, it's, if you have the luxury of the time, it's nice to spend some time trying to educate your oncologist beforehand so that they know what to expect and they're not quite so surprised. Um, when I worked at the Peter Mac, we did that for Lung and the Lung and the Sabre team. They were really well educated, they knew what to expect and they got what they expected and that was okay. They had neck team, were not expecting things to be very different and we saw hotspots in the mandibles that they had neck patients. And they became very unhappy and that surprised us a lot. Um, so the more you can be prepared and the more you can prepare your doctors for what they're going to see and what they're going to have to accept. Um, the better it is, and ideally the parallel planning process in the beginning of showing AAA and Acuros to give them an idea and emphasizing the fact that the clinical outcomes that they've been used to are tied to the dose distributions that might now look poorer than what they've been used to accepting. It's quite a complex thing for them to get their head around sometimes. Mm -hmm. One more question. Uh, do we always need to validate high computing machines with GPUs using Acuros Acuros for calculations versus calculations without GPU? I'm not quite sure what that no, question is. Either. It seems to be about the computer specs. I think it's like validating uh, machines. Like, I think they're trying to ask if we have to use the GPU while probably acceptance testing or I would say for both acceptance testing and commissioning, you use the planning computer the way you would for the subsequent planning so that you can be sure that you're commissioning the right thing. Exactly. Okay, let me see if I didn't miss anything. So at uh, Shukat Khanum at the moment, how, mu how much of your planning is done using accuracy and how much is done using other algorithms? Um, we actually do mostly lung or our lungs are definitely uh, done using Acuras. Um, so anything with lung, uh, especially SPRT lung, we do um, using Acuras and, you know, anything, you know, in the, in the chest area, in the thorax area. So we definitely do that, but, you know, that's all we can do right now with, you know, limited GPUs and all that. So, and we have a, you know, big load of patients. So, we have to, you know, but we, we yes. plan on, you know, increasing that in, in the future with more equipment yes. and yeah. So. Yeah. so we have five more minutes. Um, so what, uh, what kind of sites do you do? If, you know, like uh, SPRT, do you do a lot of lungs or liver or? So at the moment, I work at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne, and we do lung and we do spine primarily, um, mm -hmm. and brains would be the other one that we do. Um, so do you use? Do you have been? You've moved over to the Acuras like for everything, or do you? Do you have certain sites that you mostly use it for? <laughs> So it's always more complicated. The outfit has two campuses, and currently one okay. of them is using Acuras, and the other one is using AAA, just because. Okay. I'm so everything, like it's Acuras for everything, basically at one center. Okay. Yes, and in part it's because the um, what we find with the inverse planning is that the Acuras plans calculate faster, so it's not a time limitation as such, um, and it's also trying to keep things consistent and to okay. minimize the, the likelihood of error in terms of the choosing the wrong algorithm. And your, uh, all your systems are GPU-based? Fine systems? Yes, I believe so, but we're about to um, change our systems and go to a common algorithm, but also shift the, um, shift the TPS of the environment into the cloud so it's not linked to local computers anymore. Okay, cool. That will help. Yes, and it helps unify things too. And, and I know that Peter Mac had the same experience at the different campuses, went to the cloud and, and shared resources and shared planning licenses and that made life a lot easier. Okay. Uh, another question. Can you share some word on MCU? 
MCU, MCO, probably. Multi-criteria optimization? MCO, yes. What question is about? Yes. Um, I believe it because it says MCU, but I'm thinking it must be MCO. MCO trade-off option. Um, so, if, as, as I remember and as I understand, multi-criteria optimization is where you select several organs at risk and several target structures perhaps that you're interested in and you ask the um, TPS to, to, to prioritize them a bit differently and you see what the dose distribution is that comes out of a, a, a fairly complex set of plans and you can then choose your optimum one um, from that. Sorry, I, haven't, uh, I wasn't quite expecting to talk about that. I know. Okay, I would this is an easy one. They're asking, is it hectic or useful? Useful or hectic? Have you found it useful? So in the beginning, it's, it's quite a big change in the way you approach things because you have a lot more decisions to make. You have a lot more choices to make. And I think once you've gotten used to it, it gives you a better feel for if you vary certain things, how can your plan become better? So at the beginning, it's probably not a great help because it's more work. And mm -hmm. once you pass the hurdle of knowing how it works, I think it makes your planning more robust and better, definitely. Okay, so you do use it basically in your clinic routinely? Yes, and perhaps right at the end, I'd like to add a little bit about grid sizes because I've, I touched on that, but it's really important and it's something I've seen in several clinics not being thought about a lot. So in Eclipse, when we do, where you specify the algorithm, you can also specify the grid size. And although it takes longer to calculate with the smaller grid size, sometimes it really makes a difference. Particularly if your target is two centimeters or less, it can make quite a big difference to the, um, to the dose in your target. And also to doses to the organs of risk, they're very close. For example, Nick showed with the spinal cord and the, and the spinal bones around it, it'll make quite a big difference. So I would, <clears throat> if you do treat very small targets with SAVE, I would very much encourage you to think about grid size and to try to sometimes calculate with the smaller grid size to get a gut feel for when will it actually make a difference. Because if you're okay. using the two and a half mil grid size, it might not be quite as accurate. And there's nothing right. that Eclipse does to alert you to it. So do you have, so you're, what you're saying is if it's a very small, you, you increase the grid, the calculation grid, uh, decrease it, <laughs> optimize it and then final calculation increase the grid and do the final calculation so if you've got a plan with your normal grid size of, of voxels being two and a half by two and a half by two and a half mils and you think it right. might make a difference then you might make a copy of your plan you don't really optimize it you simply recalculate it with a grid size of maybe 1.25 mils and then you compare the two plans and if they're different then you learn that the calculation you did with the coarser grid wasn't quite as accurate as as it needed to be okay but you know, in order to reduce the time do, for optimization time, do you ever use the you know the calculation grid you can reduce volume, the, cal you the can, box? Yeah. You can, yeah, you can reduce the, the area of interest. That's not a problem at all, and that will right. reduce your time absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. But it's more the grid size, and choosing a smaller grid size will make your calculation take longer. Um, exactly. One way that you might see it also is if you do your patient-specific QA and the QA result isn't very good. If you then recalculate your QA plan with the finer grid size, you might find that it agrees better. And if that's what you see, and you'll see that for modulated plans, then you should be calculating your clinical plan also with the smaller grid. That's really important. Okay. Um, I think this is time for us. Thank you very much, uh, Lottie. I was really informative and um, I will I will send you know the questions the details for you to answer um, for Please some do. of those questions. Be, yes, I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it's uh, time for our third and last uh, talk. Uh, this is, uh, the topic is the role of 4DCT and 4DCBCT in SABER. Uh, the speaker is uh, Mr. Carl uh, Horsfeld. Uh, he's a medical physicist at the Queen Center for Oncology and Hematology uh, in Cottingham, UK. And special oh. thanks to him because he had to wake up really early um, to do this. So thank you again.
I hope you've had your cup of coffee. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm awake and raring to go now. Uh, I'm glad it was the last talk because I needed that time to wake up. Yeah, so in the Thank UK, so in the UK, it's uh, five twenty at the moment, so mm -hmm. it's it's very early. Um, so yeah, uh, can you see my screen? Is that sharing? Yes. Brilliant. I'll get going then. Uh, so thanks for the introduction. I'm going to be talking about the role of 4D CT and 4D CBCT in stereotactic ablative body radiotherapy. Uh, it seems like there's a lot of um, a lot of the others, uh, Nick and Lottie that have talked before me uh, have experience on other sites possibly, but I'm just going to be focusing on lung radiotherapy because that's where our experience is. So bear that in mind with what I talk about. So what I'm going to do, I'll just give a brief short introduction to our department. Uh, I think it's helpful so that you can see the resources that we have available and help to compare and contrast what you might have. Uh, then I will go into 4D CT, uh, a short bit of theory on that and the benefits for planning. Um, the theory is relevant for both the pre-treatment stage and the treatment stage, so that'll be useful to go through. And then I'm going to move on to talk about 4D CBCT for treatment verification. We've been doing this for a while now, and it's, um, it's been a fantastic tool. So our department, um, it's a combination of, we have a radi radiation physics department, which is a combination of radiotherapy, uh, nuclear medicine, and radi radiation protection. Specifically in radiotherapy, we have 11 physicists dedicated to the service. We have uh, a team of uh, oncology information system uh, staff who specifically look after our IT infrastructure and deal with reporting and things like uh, Eclipse and the Linux. We have five dedicated Linux technicians to keep things up and running, and we have eight, eight decimetrists who handle most of our radiotherapy treatment planning. Uh, this is to cover our six Linux service, which in the UK were a, approximately a medium sized center. We're part of an operation, operational delivery network of three centers. So we share our workload with, um, for a lot of sites with Leeds and Sheffield. So resources are pooled and you tend to get uh, the types of patients that uh, you can ensure that you treat enough of. So if we have any uh, oligomets patients, bone or spinal, these will probably go to bigger centers like Leeds and we'll handle most of the lung saver services uh, for our local patients. So we have one Halcyon treatment machine, three true beams, two Clinax. Uh, we have, uh, I say we have, we have two Philips Brilliance big bore CT scanners. Actually, uh, we're just in the process of replacing those with Siemens scanners. So that'll be a big change for us soon. But all the experience we're going to talk about is for the Philips scanners. We've got a, a developed brachytherapy service and a superficial service as well, and a few other smaller ancillary bits of kit. So this is where we are, uh, just on the east coast of the United Kingdom. Like I say, we're in the uh, strategic delivery network with Leeds and Sheffield. And this is our centre set on the outskirts of our town. So you can see uh, it's, it's a nice setting for patients who are going through radiotherapy. It's, it's not a nice thing to have to go through. So uh, any of the chemotherapy or radiotherapy they have is in this setting with nice views of the, the countryside. I just put, thought I'd put this on here as a, as a description of our progression to where we are now. We moved to one new centre in 2008, so it's not, not really a new centre anymore. Uh, but we spent some time getting used to the equipment and the, uh, and the pool of patients. And then we installed our first true beam in about 20, early 2012. Then we moved into eclipse planning late 2012, early 2013. We implemented 4D CT around about mid 2013, at the same time as introducing Acuros. And then we introduced our stereotactic lung radiotherapy service just shortly after that, once those pieces were in place. We then pushed to develop our PET scanning service to make sure that PET scans were done in the diagnostic position, sorry, in, in a radiotherapy position on a flat, flat bed top with a mobilization kit, which helped to make sure our registration was, um, had less, uh, less errors present due to patient setup. This was a big improvement to help our clinicians delineate target volumes correctly. We then, we had a, a second true beam and introduced triple F at that time because we had uh, two machines that could then do it. And this provided us with um, most, much shorter treatment times for our patients and overall a better treatment experience for those patients. We then got a third true beam. And at this point we had two machines that had the uh, 
clips at the Varian advanced imaging uh, applications. So we introduced 4D CBCT at that time in 2000, mid 2018. And we've been uh, using it ever since and it's been a fantastic resource. And since then we've also acquired the Varian gated CBCT license, which we use for any patient that requires gating. Just to compare and contrast, we obviously, before introducing 4D CT, we used uh, 3D CT for all of our lung patients. This was a generic margin recipe for uh, tumor location, tumor type. Obviously, this is a snapshot that could be acquired at basically any point in the patient's breathing cycle and, and um, was probably not very patient specific, or it definitely wasn't very patient specific. I, I imagine with these margin recipes, knowing what I know now with 4D CT, this, this often led to probably too much of lung tissue being treated and, and possibly some of the time too little lung tumor being treated uh, lung tissue being treated as well oh, sorry lung tumor being treated and there's not as much information there's not nearly as rich a data set with a 3d scan as there is with a 4d scan so there's uh, less information to make comprehensive decisions if you're doing a 3d scan then um, you'll probably be using something like a fluoroscopy uh, simulation session or a day zero imaging session to confirm or uh, quantify tumor motion. So I really like this graphic and Nick's already shown this one. I think it really shows you the differences between the uh, the voluming techniques that you might want to use. So the left hand image shows us a 3D approach where we have our uh, ar almost arbitrary random position of our tumor or depending on, on what kind of breath uh, coaching you give to your patient if you're doing a 3D scan. We get a snapshot of that GTV and then we do a generic margin. And then we've got um, the three more developed techniques that I'm gonna talk about, which are all valid strategies to use uh, for modern radiotherapy. So we have the generation of IITV, which is basically what I'm gonna be talking about in relation to 4D CTs. So this is where we have a GTV that's shared across multiple phases and we delineate the GTV on all of those phases or maybe a subset uh, and then generate our ITV from that. And then we have a small, smaller PTV expansion that's based on geometric uncertainties on our planning system, our QA, our machines. And then we've also got the gated, gated uh, exhale uh, voluming technique where we might do prospective gating and only acquire uh, CT, a CT scan for a patient in a particular fixed um, breath hold. And then there's also the mid ventilation approach that some centers are using. Uh, this is much, I would say this is much rarer. Um, and it's like Nick said, it's, it's to do with uh, capturing the tumor where it spends most of its time. So I just thought I'd put this in here just to show you how a 4D CT looks, but I think you've already seen one of these now. Um, you can see that it's basically multiple CT image series that are combined together in whatever planning system you're using, like as we're using in Eclipse. And then we can move you through these, this structure set and uh, delineate across multiple phases. But how do we acquire this? So just a quick bit of theory. Uh, so we've got our CT scanner and that CT scanner is rotating all the time and acquiring projections as, uh, as the gantry rotates. Uh, those projections are, uh, in our center quite helically. I quite like this graphic, uh, it's quite a good one. Um, and as the gantry progresses, the couch progresses through the bore and the gantry rotates in a spiral fashion, we are getting a sample of data at each point of our patient. Um, so that's half the story and that's all you need to do a 3D CT. If you're doing a 4D CT, then you have additional information from a secondary system such as RPM or possibly even uh, maybe perhaps Philips's Bellow system or uh, align RT's uh, gate CT system, vision RT's gate CT system. Um, what we need to do for a 4D CT is after the acquisition, when we have all our, all our 2D projections as the gantry rotates, we combine this with the breathing information and place all the projection data into time bins that represent each particular part of the patient's breathing cycle. And then this allows the reconstructor to make 10 or however many reconstructions, depending on what your uh, requirements are. So I, I really like this. I got it from uh, uh, the advanced, the Varian Advanced Imaging course in Clatterbridge, and it shows you how the phases are made. So if we assume that the breathing cycle uh, is from inhale to inhale, then most 4D CT is phase 
binning. And what that basically means is we subdivide between the two inhale uh, points by time. We use 10 divisions in our department, but others use six and others use 12. Uh, we found 10 is perfectly fine for our needs. And what happens is the first the uh, inhale, we acquire the first slice for the first uh, phase, so the, possibly the 0% phase. And then as we go through, we get the next phase and the first slice again, the next phase and the next phase and so on and so forth until we have all of the first slices for the uh, first breathing cycle. And then as we go on to the next patient's breathing cycle, we get the uh, more and more data until we have our full full study set. Um, obviously, uh, with multi-slice scanners, it's not one slice that you're probably acquiring at one time. It's 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 going to be a block, so it's faster than um, faster than this. But that's the basic theory, and this leads to these kind of images. So, in the UK, why would we do this? Um, in the UK, a lot of the radiotherapy that is delivered for stereotactic use follows guidance called the Stereotactic Ablative Body Radiotherapy Consortium Guidelines. This is a national group that was put together that pooled um, a large uh, selection of literature together to decide on how the UK would do radiotherapy. And then this dis is distributed to all UK centers or it's, uh, it, well, anybody can get access to this. It's, um, it's a free online resource, but it's basically what we do as a country. So what the recommendations in here are that all patients must have um, motion assessed but via some method and we choose to use 4 DCT in our department. It then requires accounting for the full range of tumor motion and the movement of the surrounding organs at risk um, and 4 DCT is, our, is one way of doing this. Then the requirements also ask that we produce a motion adapted GTV, which again, going back to that diagram by Walthus, uh, that would be delineating that based on, um, it's, it's trying to produce an ITV that covers the full range of tumor travel. There's, there's a number of methods. Uh, Nick already talked about maximum intensity projections, uh, which is very valid and, and much faster than what we do. Uh, there's also the idea of doing a maximum inspiration and a maximum expiration scan and then figuring out um, your too extensive motion from that scan. Not many centers in the UK do that. Um, I can see how it might cover the maximum range of travel, but I don't think it's something we'd want to do. I think it's maybe employed when you can't get a decent breathing trace for a patient, uh, but we, yeah, we, we don't do that usually. Uh, and what we do is we get our poor clinicians to contour on all 10 phases of a 4D CT scan. Uh, it gives us a lot more flexibility if, um, if we need to make changes to the patient's planning approach. So here we go. Here's, here's an example of one of our patients. You can see here that it's got two GTVs. There's a smaller GTV and a larger GTV. I put this on here just because it highlights that we what we would have normally done would be to delineate all the, the full range of the tumor travel, which is this larger GTV. And then we have a 4D CT review task for every patient that gets one. And at that point, we make a decision as to whether the tumor motions uh, within our acceptable criteria or not. If the tumor motions more than a centimeter, what we do is we uh, make decisions about get, whether to gate a patient, or we would definitely assess the patient to see if they're suitable for gating. So this patient was, they had 1.2 centimeters of tumor motion. So we decided to limit and produce a new planning scan within the Eclipse environment based on only a limited number of the patient's phases. So we reproduced this plan based on uh, phases 20% to 60%. And then this is the volume you see, that is the 20% to 60%. So we get a more, much more dense, uh, dense representation of the tumor rather than it being smeared over all the phases. And obviously this is a uh, geometry that's more specific to how we're going to treat the patient. Uh, and we've saved a little bit of lung tissue by having the information. You could have made this, uh, this decision uh, by having fluoroscopy, but I think 4 DCT is a little bit neater and quicker, as long as you're confident that the patient's tumor motion doesn't change between pre-treat and treatment. We also have the patient's breathing information, which is vital for us to be able to make a decision on whether we can do passive respiratory gating, which is the main technique that we use. 
So you can see that the patient spends the vast majority the vast majority of their time it, within a limited number of phases. They have a couple of extreme phases where there's a lot of motion and those we try to avoid doing anything with. So we set our external boundaries or upper and lower uh, upper threshold on treatment to be within uh, something we see on this graph. So we, we would use this graph in combination with the plan to pick which gate, phases to gate on. Um, and then we just end up with uh, all of our tumor volume delineated on every phase. So, I mean, 4 DCT was gonna be quick. I think it's quite commonplace now, but I'd just like to summarize that the advantages it gives, I think is more useful uh, planning information, richer, de more detailed planning information. It's also close to a slow CT scan, uh, fairly well time weighted average tumor position as well. So it means that the density of the tumor that you're doing your calculation for is more representative of what you're gonna be treating than a 3D scan would be. I think it gives you increased confidence that you're treating the right volume for your patients and uh, gives you confidence that you're using the right PTV margin as well. For particular mobile tumors, I think it gives you a lot of information about how to plan, uh, whether you should be or shouldn't be planning it, the patient as a gated treatment. And for us, I think we were worried uh, for a long time as a, a planning concern about the interplay effect, which comes into play due to the motion of the tumor and the motion of the MLC leaves uh, causing uncertainties in your dose calculation. This is more of an issue for tumors that move over one and a half to two centimeters from, from what I've read, although there's, there's a lot of uh, discussion on this subject. Um, but by limiting tumor travel to a centimeter when we feel that it's large, we, I think we negate this issue for the most part. But 4D CT doesn't come without consequences and you can introduce a lot of artifacts by using 4D CT. And these artifacts can undermine your confidence in um, treating accurately. So this 4D CT review test that I say we, we have, that is uh, one of the roles of that job is to review that there's no significant artifacts at the level of the tumor. We would, um, if we have any artifacts that are away from the tumor, we would just essentially ignore them. Um, but if we have any artifacts that are at the level of the tumor, then we would request a rescan for these patients and deal with that issue straight away. So because my clinicians, our clinicians have been very nice and, and they contour every single uh, phase for us. And actually because I have an involvement in Eclipse scripting, uh, which is, um, a programming interface for the Eclipse environment. I was able to make a script that runs through all of our patient data set and produces and figures out the center of mass of all of our uh, delineated target volumes. So what this graph shows here is the maximum displacement in each axis for each individual lung patient. And you can see that the vast majority of motion is in the long direction, which is no surprise. But I think some having something like this to be able to understand your population is, is very powerful. And this is not uh, national data or international data. This is our specific group of patients. There's over a thousand points on this graph and you can see that the vast majority actually are all on top of one another around this kind of uh, amplitude. And that you can see our thresholds for taking action as to whether we will get a patient. So we, we actually don't get that many patients really. Um, not compared to the vast number of patients that we actually see. If you take that data and re-represent re it on a graph relative to the center of mass of lung, what you end up getting is uh, an image that shows you that our tumors are actually well distributed within the lung. Um, and then what we, what I also did was I chose to conditionally format the points that are greater than a centimeter in travel. And what you can see is most of our patients with large motion sit in the right lung in the lower portion of the lung, which is exactly what you'd expect. This sits right above the diaphragm, so it's no surprise. But what is a surprise is the tumors that are right in the apex that do move a lot. And if you were using a technique like 3D without having fluoroscopy to back that up, you would possibly not be anticipating the motion of these tumors. They can be, uh, they can throw you off a lot. So having 4 DCT captures details about patients like this. Uh, this is just a, a slide on artifacts, but I think I've talked about that. So that's it for 4DCT. I'm just going to talk about 
IGRT and 4D CBCT now. Um, it's very important for stereotactic to be treated stereotactic radiotherapy to be treated accurately, especially when the fraction sizes are so small. So the intention is to deliver obviously radiotherapy accurately to the target volume as planned. Um, imaging is 100% necessary uh, and the most useful tool we have for this. Uh, we want to be able to account for inter and intrafraction changes in position of the tumor, which um, an imaging enables us to do. And this enables us to be uh, more conformal and have greater confidence that we're, we're in the right place. So I think this, uh, I really like this graph showing tumor control probability as a, in relation to the treatment technique that you're using. I'm just going to put this little animation up on the right hand side as well. And what you can see, and what this graph is basically saying that it, in the past when we were using a full field brick or full field approach, uh, planning was quite robust. If our tumor had any systematic moves, left and right, and some post, then if it was moving in those directions, it would still be moving into a beam that was probably a good proportion of your treatment dose. If you move to a technique such as IMRT, where your dose fall off is incredibly rapid, then any dive, any crossing of the boundary of your PTV leads to a very significant underdose of that tumor. So. What this basic, what this basic graph basically says is that margins need to be bigger if you're doing IMRT or imaging needs to be better. So we need to be more on target and doing daily corrections for stereotactic lung treatments or liver or whatever, if we're going to have such sharp margins. And that's never more important than if you're doing a single fraction treatment where you don't get another chance. If you're doing 55 gray and 20, you know, 37, 74 gray and 37, you know, you, if you have a small miss on one day, that's not a problem. But if you have a miss of it, even, even the edge of your target for an 18 gray three fraction treatment, then that's going to be a significant portion of your, of your delivery. So we need to be correcting for this. That's, that's the point I'm trying to make. So the UK consortium guidelines suggest that if, if a 4D CT is being used at the planning stage, then 4D CBCT should ideally be used at fraction one. Um, but they go on to say further to that, the use of 4D CBCT at all treatment fractions is recommended for lower lobe treatments. Well, this was the decision we were gonna make anyway before this more recent guidance came out. So we were really happy to see that this agreed with exactly what we wanted to do with lung patients. And then they also recommend for upper lobe treatments that they at least get day one for the CBCT to ensure that tumor motion is the same as it was at pre-treatment. But what is it? So, well, it's a method of motion management. It's a method of understanding how our patient moves relative to how they were at C CT. If our patient looked exactly the same at, pre at treatment as compared to how they do at pre-treatment, then we would have no concerns. We could assume that the scenario we plan to treat, we were treating, but lungs are incredibly complex and there's a lot of changes that go on. So motion management that you might wanna use might be uh, planning for motion unrestrained, or this is used in a 4D CT, it's understanding your motion. You could do passive respiratory gating, which is actually the type we use most of the time. Uh, most of our patients are above 70 and not very compliant when it comes to doing breath hold technique but we found that we can do an end exhale passive respiratory gating quite well. And occasionally we do coached respiration as well, where we, where we, we maybe do get them to hold their breath, but that's very few. There's not many patients we try that successfully with. There's also more, uh, <coughs> more mechanical uh, adaptions that we can make to our patient, such as abdominal compression, which has already been discussed. Um, it's not something we've ever, tried just because a lot of experience in a lot of UK centers, the descriptions of how easy it was to work with compression were not very encouraging. So we went down the avenue of using gating and uh, imaging to give us confidence that we we're in the right place. But I think we're expanding into other sites soon. So abdominal compression might be something we end up having to do. There's also active breath control. So forcing a particular amplitude of a patient's breathing and then motion tracking. Just to give you an idea of what most of the UK does, uh, you can see that the vast majority of centers do 4 CT for lung and liver and, and adrenals. 
only six centres in the UK are doing abdominal compression at the time of this study in 2019, and even less are doing things like deep inspiration breath hold. Uh, those numbers increase when you get into liver and pancreas and adrenals. Um, but like I say, I don't have much experience of those in the clinic. But it's interesting to see what people are doing anyway. So what can change? So if you're taking a patient from pre-treat to treatment, there are going to be changes. What we've found is patients breathing amplitude can change. Their um, we can have baseline shifts, and we can also have disagreements between bony anatomy and soft tissue. Uh, so you can't assume that if you're doing a bony match that your tumor is in the right position, which is why 3D matching or 2D matching with fiducials is so important. Um, I'll just go on to this next sli slide briefly. These, this is just um, three examples of how different a tumor match can be on a day-to-day -day basis. I think this is the same, same patient. And you can see that there's a huge change in tumor position relative to bone. Now our approach in our department is to do a bony match to begin with, and then to make adjustments if we feel that we don't have overlap. Um, but 40 CBCT is gonna give you the information to make that decision robustly because you're gonna be able to see the edge of the tumor disc, uh, motion with whatever matching strategy you use. I think it gives you the confidence to do a tumor match and then um, review or a bony match and then review and have confidence that what you're treating is accurate. Um, what led us to want to do this, uh, one particular patient comes to mind. Uh, we were at the stage when we first started Sabre that we were doing pre and post treatment CBCT. And then if we had changes in how the patient breathed, we might do a mid treatment CBCT as well. So you can see that the, we had this patient they were set, aligned to their tattoos as normal in, in the patient's mobilization. And then we had a one centimeter move after imaging to, to chase the tumor, which was fairly large, uh, but the match looked really good and we weren't too worried. But then the patient's breathing changed a little bit. And then we did a, just to be sure, we did a mid treatment CBCT. We had another half centimeter move on that patient. Uh, but again, the match looked really good. So we thought we'd got to the right place. Post-treatment, we went back the other direction, 0.75 centimeters. So there's things going on with the patient's breathing and you really need to be careful that you have this kind of information available to you. Because if you don't see that a patient's breathing has changed, then you might miss, um, miss your target. So 2018, we introduced offline 4D CBCT on the varying system because it was all that was available to us. Uh, we quickly introduced online CBCT as, it as soon as it became available. And then we drastically uh, increased the amount of 4D CBCT we were doing for this category of patients. This is just uh, a video. It'll, oh, it won't play. Uh, but you can see how grainy the images are. But that doesn't, we've always found it to be adequate for our purposes when we're matching to a moving tumor that's uh, surrounded by lung. It's quite, it's still quite easy to make out the target if you're um, used to using these on a daily basis. So it is quite grainy, but it's, um, it's usable. Anyway, because we, did a pilot study introducing offline 4D CBCT. This gave me the advantage of being able to take the 3D online match that the radiographers had done and do a couple of different matches with it. So we did a bony match, we did 4D CT match, and we did a 3D CT soft tissue match. And I wanted to know which was the best thing to use, bony or soft tissue. And then we had some people look at them and decide whether they were happy with which particular a number of different matching strategies and we ended up getting um the best match for the tumor full range of travel once reviewed with the 4 dct being best for tumor half the time but only half the time so this this left us in a quandary because it meant that um there wasn't a an ideal strategy that we could start with which led to us having more led to us putting more faith into the 4d cbct and using it much more we also looked at the unadjusted online match for the 3D scan and found that 13% of the time, if you included the 4D information, the match was very tentative. It wasn't uh, something that filled me with confidence. And the when you looked at the motion of the tumor, it would go right up to the edge of the PTV, or in one case, slightly beyond. If you then rematch that patient with 4D CBCT information, 96% of the time, we could get a very good match. And one, uh, four percent of the time, uh, we got that issue where we went right up to the edge of the PTV. But without the 4D CBCT information, we wouldn't have been able to make this assessment, not without using something like fluoroscopy. So it made decision on making online much more fast and robust. In this patient, 
could then, these patients who fall into this tentative category can get replanned very quickly because we know what the issue is. So what do the other UK centres do for matching? I'm sorry to interrupt, Carl, but we have yeah. like seven, seven or eight minutes left. I'm, I'm very nearly finished. I've just got, okay. I, can, I can finish after this slide, um, really. That's um, a yeah, sorry, I don't have much more. So most centres in the UK are doing online CBCT soft tissue matching. So that's 3D CBCT soft tissue matching. Um, 4D CBCT is being taken up. And you can see that uh, nine out of the centres that have submitted data in this uh, report were doing online 4D CBCT, such as, such as we're doing. Uh, but I think that'll be a, we'll see a change in this. I think the more centres will take this on as we go forward. So I did have some other data, but I think, I think we'll stop there. So I'd just like to say thank you uh, for being included in this programme. Uh, thanks to Dr. Uh, to Chief Business of Mohammed Rafi and uh, Miners for uh, hosting today. And I'll take questions now. Thank you, Carl. This was very interesting. Um, I think we have a few questions. So there is a question where they're saying that um, if the tumor size is reduced, have you seen where the tumor size reduces during treatment? Uh, what will be assessed on 4D CT? And is there a need for replanning? If the tumor size is reduced, we don't replan. Um, we, yeah, if, if the tumor size goes down, we don't replan. We assume that our tumor is still within the PTV that we originally delineated. If the clinicians are happy with the original clinical protocol constraints, then we're happy that the ultimate risk aren't receiving a significant dose. So we continue. Yeah, there's another one with, uh, they, they're asking, what do you mean by maximum inspiration and maximum expiration dating scan? So that would be getting the patient, to, that would be doing two scans, uh, two 3D scans, one with the patient at inhale and one with the, the same patient at exhale in the same planning session. And then uh, we don't do this technique. It's something that I've, I've heard talked about twice at different conferences. But essentially what they then do is treat it like a 4D CT scan, delineate the tumor on both the inhale and the exhale, and then make an ITV that's a combination of these two scans. So, so basically the, exhale the breath, hold the breath, and then inhale yeah. and hold the breath, and then, yeah, okay. Exactly. So breath, breath hold at uh, exhalation, and, and okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, another one. Can you please share your experience when motion of tumor is too much, too large in 4D CBCT? At this stage, what would you recommend? Uh, there's two things we can do. If, if the scenario for the patient has changed significantly, then we would replan. Uh, we would take them to the simulator and do a full new replan. There's, uh, there's something else you can do. If tumor motion is only slightly larger than it was from our planning scan, we introduced backup gating. So we would uh, we would try and bring our breathing threshold on our breathing traces down a little bit until um, tumor motion was back within our PTV volume. And at that point, we might use something like either a gated CBCT or a fluoroscopy image to confirm that tumor motion doesn't extend beyond the edge of the PTV. So that's probably a quicker solution just to introduce backup gating in that way for passive respiratory gating. Uh, but yeah, or it might be a refund if it's a green chain because we would want to okay, understand. Thank you, I we... think. Oh, go ahead, please. I was just going to say, I, we would like to understand what has changed about a patient and I think a 4D CT at the planning system, it, it, on a CT scan would give us much more information than, than 4D CBCT. 4D CBCT tends to be quite uh, grainy. Okay, I think that's it. This is the end of our time. Um, Carl, thank you so much again for well, once again for you know joining us this early, and I that's hope okay. you can get some rest. Yeah, yeah. I'm to bed. So, <laughs> thank you, thank you so much again. Thank you, everyone. Uh, Nick, uh, Lottie, and Carl, thank you, everyone, again for this wonderful symposium. Thanking, thank you for you know, agreeing to uh, talk and making it a success. Thank you very much.
Bye-bye. Thank you.